that's good morning, good day, and good evening, and a warm welcome to our second webinar, Introduction to Climate Studio, Part B on Energy. Um, this webinar uh, is a continuation of the webinar that we um, presented two days ago on Climate Studio Daylighting. For those of you uh, that weren't um, able to join us for this or who want to go back and review the content, you can actually go now to um, salama.com under the training material for Climate Studio and we have a recording of the webinar along with the Rhino file that we used for the demo uh, two days ago. Uh, that's the same Rhino file that we'll be using today as well. So you can download that and follow along at your own pace if you want as well. And uh, for those of you that weren't there uh, two days ago, just to give you an overview, we uh, conducted a daylighting analysis of a single floor of a multi-story um, office building that you see on the screen here. And we did an annual glare analysis, we did a daylight availability study, and we finished off with an electric lighting study. And here you see a screenshot from the part of the building where we did an electric lighting study on to verify that with this choice of luminous and the grid layout that you see on the screen, we would get the required five, uh, 300 lux across uh, the whole work plane of the space. And the lighting power density that we calculated based on this for the space is 3.5 watt per square meter. So this is kind of the hook that we're gonna use today as well when we continue with our um, energy analysis of the same space. And for those of you that didn't join us two days ago, just very briefly a quick introduction. Um, we are Salama. We are a software company that started about 10 years ago when we were all at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Now three of us are still at education working on environmental performance analysis research at uh, Cornell, the University of Toronto and at MIT. And Je Jeff Niemers and uh, John Sargent are working full time <coughs> for Salama right now. Uh, the demo today will be conducted by Timo Dogan, and uh, during the demo, John Sargent and I will be fielding your questions, and I'll talk a little more on this uh, in a second. And uh, sorry for the repetition, just to get us all on the same page, while are we doing this? Our declared goal is to reduce carbon emissions within the built environment. And if we want to keep global temperature increases below um, 1.5 degrees Celsius, we know that we have to uh, dramatically reduce the carbon emission uh, that we're using as a society, especially in buildings. So to keep that goal of 1.5 degrees, we have 580 gigatons of carbon left worldwide to burn. And out of this burnable carbon, about 230 gigatons are left for buildings to burn until we need a net zero building stock by 2050. And of course, given the life, uh, time of buildings, we have to start implementing these dramatic measures today. How can we do this? Uh, the American Institute of Architects recommends the use of building performance simulation software for this. This quote here, building performance simulation is no longer just a good idea for some architectural practices. It's an essential part of building design and delivery, something that we fully subscribe on. And um, how do we do that in practice? You come up with an architectural design. In our case, we're using the Rhino environment. So if this is your design for a space, then you can conduct a multi-dimensional analysis of your space for daylight availability, glare, and energy. And if you then find out that your building has a problem, for example, with glare, the hard step is to react to this information and to add a shading device or do something else. Now we know that this is very hard for design teams, for architects uh, to understand the results and react to them. We've been working in this field for a long time and we have all these different workflows, but we found them all very compartmentalized and we wanted to work towards a more integrated, more usable set of tools. So for that, we worked with um, what we call the Solema Executive User Group, a group of 14 uh, manufacturers, architecture firms and consulting firms to um, develop a tool that would be usable in their day-to-day -day practice. And this is what we're gonna show you today. As I said, we're gonna concentrate on the energy component of Climate Studio. Our guiding principle during the development of this tool was we want a simple intuitive user interface, faster simulations, validated material libraries, improved visualizations and automated reporting scheme. 
So during the uh, today's uh, webinar, we'll we broke it up into two components. First, as I said, we'll be continuing in Rhino our analysis of the same uh, flaw that you've seen before, but now from an energy perspective, and then we'll be switching into Climate Studio Grasshopper for further analysis as well. Um, you are invited during the um, demonstration to ask questions. If you are not too familiar with the Zoom environment, if you uh, you have basically the chat box and the question and answer part. So please use the question and answer part, uh, post your questions, and John Sargent and I will do our best to answer them. Uh, live during the talk, we will be also keeping tab on the general uh, topics that you're raising and we'll be reviewing them uh, towards the end as well. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Timo for the actual demo. Hi everyone, um, this is Timo Dogen. Um, welcome also from, uh, from my side. Um, it's great to have you all and we're really excited to share this kind of the, the energy modeling side of Climate Studio with you. Um, can you all see my screen at this point? Yes. Um, okay, wonderful. So what you're seeing here is kind of this, um, my personal layout um, of, of kind of working with Climate Studio within Rhino. Um, and I opened up the model that John Sargent created in the last webinar showing kind of this um, a floor plate uh, with a fully glazed facade. This is how he started off uh, in, in the first webinar. And then uh, kind of towards the end, uh, the model was optimized um, into kind of something that, that looked like this, uh, a more brutalist uh, facade with smaller opening ratios and, and a bit of uh, shading um, through kind of these uh, deeper facade elements. Um, so, and what, at the same time, kind of, we have in this layer structure, um, a thermal side and I'm going to deactivate the daylighting model and I'm going to switch to, um, a wireframe view. So if I were to model, um, this kind of fully glazed, um, building, then we would, we would see here kind of, I've broken this up into, to my zones. Um, and then I have a, a layer where I'm modeling the glazing um, basically as kind of simple flat surfaces um, that are kind of um, laid, on, laid on top of the kind of exterior of surface of the zone. So this is a bit of a different modeling paradigm where we model a geometry as kind of um, with zero thickness and we, we model these zones as enclosed volumes um, um, and, and then that, that describes kind of a thermal zone. Um, if you kind of, um, this is kind of where I'm starting uh, with this modeling um, exercise today. Um, then, then I want to kind of point, so Johnny kind of walked you through these um, workflows here. Then there's at the, at the very end, there's the thermal modeling workflow tab. And if you click on this, um, you'll basically be kind of brought to this uh, user interface on the right hand side where you see um, kind of the the widget that um, describes what you need to do. You set, you can set the climate. In this case, it's already kind of preset correctly because I'm using Johnny's file from, from the last webinar. And then um, the, the second step that I need to do to kind of build or convert this geometry into an energy model is to kind of make, uh, add some objects to my uh, object table, which you see down here at the bottom. So um, the first step would be to um, maybe grab the zone. So I'm, I'm selecting the volumes and I can use Rhino's layer selection methodology here to quickly grab all, uh, all mod model zones. And then I'm just going to kind of uh, click on this button here to convert them into thermal zones. And um, this presents you with um, a window that allows you to name the zones. And I'm just going to leave it at this generic uh, zone name for now because I don't have too many, but for larger models, obviously naming the zones. Uh, accordingly will help uh, an organization. And then I have, um, then I have this uh, kind of um, large table here that uh, where you see zone templates that are part of our library. So you see, we do have uh, templates from uh, Swiss architectural norm that references kind of the, uh, the interior workings of a space, um, looking at kind of, uh, you know, lighting uh, equipment and people densities and so forth. And we also have um, the DOE commercial prototype buildings um, parsed and completely um, kind of made completely available through this library. So you can kind of select this as a starting point um, if, you, uh, um, if, you, if you're building up a thermal model. So, and I wanna kind of 
um, model in Office so I can search um, through these um, templates. And I want to start with an Office that is a lightweight construction um, that references some of these um, uh, Swiss architectural norm interior settings and has a U value of the envelope of 0.4. Um, so this is what I want to start off with. And then I basically just have to select the template and click OK. Then these, now these geometries that I had kind of modeled in Rhino are converted into thermal zones that I can now uh, select through my model uh, modeling um, uh, model table over here. So I can, I can individually now, obviously all of these zones are kind of um, assigned identical um, templates. I can change that at any time. I can um, kind of edit the template also in great detail if I want to. Um, um, basically all of the kind of the settings that are behind these templates are accessible and editable um, and so forth. So uh, I'll leave this for this demo. I'll leave it as, as, as is, uh, all uniform and simple. Um, but uh, I just wanted to show kind of the complexity that, uh, that is behind it that you have control over, um, but that you don't need to worry about if you kind of just uh, getting started. Um, so the second step for me would be to um, add the, the windows to this model. And I can do this simply by, again, same process, select the objects um, in the Rhino layer panel. And then I um, add those kind of objects as um, windows to my thermal model. And again, I have um, presented with a bunch of settings um, that um, define um, the, the glazing or the, the windows in this model. The first and most important one obviously is the glazing construction. And if I click on this, uh, I, I can kind of select a glazing construction from a fairly large library. And again, we have um, parsed data and validated data from different sources. So this is, we have a huge set of uh, IGDB glazing, um, glazing sets that you can select from. We can use filters to select um, only double glazing, for example, and, uh, and, th and then go from there. So I'm just gonna go with this clear, clear um, uh, construction, which is a double pane glass with a visible transmittance of 0 0.7. Uh, the U value is not that great, it's 3.1, uh, and a solar heat gain coefficient of 0 0.7. So this is, um, this is what I'm settling on for now, but uh, knowing that this is not kind of the best solution uh, out there. Um, and then you can set a bunch of other things here, such as dynamic shading systems. In this case, they are turned off. You can turn them on and uh, select whether it's an interior shade or an exterior shade. And you can also control um, the um, or specify the control types in this case. So uh, how do you want to trigger these shading systems? So this could be done through bringing in um, data from the daylighting model uh, as a schedule, or you can define kind of custom controls such as this um, uh, high solar radiation on the window, and then you have a set point that then triggers this. Or you could use, for example, high outdoor air temperature to then trigger, uh, trigger the shading. I'm just gonna leave this uh, turned off uh, for now. And then these, uh, these settings down below are uh, relevant if you're using more advanced airflow simulations. And then uh, if, if you're also trying to model interior zones uh, and interior windows that have a uh, zone mixing component to them. So this is relevant for atria where you want to model stratification and so forth. Um, none of this is kind of uh, relevant at this point, but I just wanted to show you the, the options that are, that are available. So I've selected my clear, clear glass and um, basically everything else is turned off. Um, and once I click OK, I, I basically have these windows as part of my model. The last thing that I want to do is I want to model this as a kind of maybe top floor of, of a multi-story building. So I'm going to assume that the bottom part uh, here of this, of this thermal model is actually the, the floor is adiabatic because there's uh, similar, similar zones probably uh, underneath this, uh, this geometry. So for that, I, I created kind of uh, boundary condition objects under this layer, which are basically just replicates of the floor geometry. If I select them, I can, I can then convert those into kind of objects that define a boundary condition of a specific surface. So if I click on, um, Boundary condition, I can select adiabatic. You could model ground contact in this case as well, or you can model ground contact with uh, using the FC factor method. And then these two parameters, the F factor and the C factor become relevant. 
Um, I want to select adiabatic. I don't want to model any heat transfer through these um, bottom surfaces at this point. So I click OK. Then these are kind of uh, part of my, uh, become part of my um, object table. And I can, uh, again, you know, kind of click in here and select and uh, change settings individually after the fact if I like. Um, so this is kind of uh, all that it takes to build a thermal model um, from scratch. Um, now I'm ready to run the simulation. I click on this play button. Um, and then you see um, the Energy Plus uh, window pop up. The simulation is uh, warming up. And then uh, it's calculating the shading um, for each time step, uh, depending on kind of what frequency you have selected here. And once this is complete, um, the um, CS uh, interface switches to the results explorer. And um, as you see here, um, let me kind of um, fold this down. So this starts with kind of a summary table uh, that gives you the site EUI. It um, tells you about the operation mill carbon, and it also estimates energy cost for you. Um, and then compares this to the AIA uh, 2030 challenge baselines um, for the specific uh, use type. So in this case, it was an office. And the, the baseline that the AIA is using, they're using the CPEX data from 2003. Um, uh, as a baseline, and you see kind of here, we are to, close to 280 uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared per year for the, for the EY. So we are, we are not saving anything. Uh, we are above the baseline. That's not good. Um, but that was to be expected kind of with the settings that I chose for this model. Um, now, um, now, it might be interesting to kind of explore a bit more about how the, the building behaves from an energy perspective. So you can kind of select this tab. Uh, and then look at the energy use intensity kind of broken into these monthly, um, into this monthly chart showing kind of the heating, the cooling energy uh, that goes into it and uh, lighting equipment, hot water and uh, fan energy if you're modeling a system with it. Um, and uh, now you can, there's a couple of other metrics that we uh, think are really imp important. So you can kind of look at this as just kind of not, not uh, total energy use um, but then you can also get like with a, with a click of a button an overview of how the comfort is in this, uh, in this space. So you can see uh, from in, in the first webinar, Johnny um, identified that there's uh, severe visual comfort problems in, in a space like this. Um, and then he, he presented a couple of kind of uh, techniques to mitigate uh, glare problems, visual comfort problems through blinds, and then uh, ultimately changing the facade design entirely. And Kind of to add to this, uh, the thermal perspective, you see here there's um, si significant discomfort problems in the zones. So what you're looking at here is a, um, basically we call those uh, fever curves of the building. And what you're seeing here is the zone operative temperature plotted. Um, but in, um, and then um, we are kind of uh, measuring the cumulative hours above uh, or below a certain temperature. So you're seeing in this case for uh, zone number five, we are kind of 600 hours above uh, 29 degrees Celsius. Or, or even worse, we could go kind of over here and then look at, uh, look at zone nine or zone one, which um, apparently are even more kind of um, problematic in this case. So with that, um, I, I've seen enough. This is not a good design, so I need to kind of do a couple of changes. So I want to... Um, adopt all of Johnny's daylight optimization pieces um, uh, and bring that into my model. Um, for that, I have prepared um, different model geometry that I want to bring in. I have these, the smaller windows that were modeled and I have abstracted an abstracted version of kind of this brutalist facade with, um, with depth here that I want to bring in. So uh, for that, I need to update my model um, and uh, I need to kind of remove these uh, older large windows. So I can kind of just kind of take them out of the um, can take them out of the um, the table uh, in this case, and um, and then start adding adding uh, the the smaller geometry here. No. Select the the glazing and add them to the table. Oops. Something's wrong with my selection. So let's remove those. Oh. Okay. 
And now I want to select my new glazing. So I select the objects and then again, add them to my model. And I was using the clear, clear glass. Oops. And there it was. I want to use the same glass again. Hit OK. Uh, and then I want to add, in addition to this, I want to add the um, shading elements, which are on this layer. So I can add those as shading objects by just using this button. Um, OK, so now if I run this again, I should see um, a change in the results. We have smaller windows. I didn't change any of the settings for the zones uh, as of yet. Okay. Um, all right. Now, um, looking at this result, um, I see that the energy use hasn't changed dramatically. I'm still not um, saving uh, compared to the baseline that the AI put it forward. But if I look at uh, my comfort, um, this has gotten a lot better. And I can kind of directly flick back and forth between the options that I'm looking at and compare the difference of the results. So this has been somewhat of an improvement, but there's uh, obviously more work to do in this case um, to bring the EUI down uh, further. So what I want to do next is I want to um, um, I want to upgrade the envelope. So from from here, I want to kind of uh, go in and change a couple of things in this case. So I want to use a different envelope that um, um, has a better uh, U-value and has a slightly lower infiltration rate. So um, again, I have a template for this. Um, and what you're seeing here is kind of, I have kind of modeled or pre-prepared these for us. And I'll walk us through these kind of settings here in a second. So um, I can select this, um, this template and apply it. And if I want to kind of look more specifically, what this really entails is like the, the big change that, we, that I made. Uh, moving forward as I lowered the infiltration rate from 0 0.9 to 0 0.5 and the construction has been set to a construction with a U value of 0 0.2 and it's a lightweight construction. I can also click on this interface and then take a closer look at what I'm modeling here. You see again we have a large library of uh, typical constructions that, that we can choose from. So I can select um, a lightweight construction, I can select a heavier construction that has a concrete uh, slab uh, or wall as part of it. I can change the kind of uh, the thickness of the, of the um, insulation and so forth. If you don't find what you want in here, then you can obviously also create your own constructions and this can be done by just taking one, duplicating it, uh, giving it a new name, and then um, you can find it in the library and start editing, um, mod modifying the layers, um, uh, changing the thickness, for example, here to 15 centimeters and adding kind of more, uh, more insulation if you want um, in this case, right? So, and then this, this automatically calculates the U value for you. Uh, it calculates the heat capacity for you as an indicator of how much thermal mass you have. And it also tracks uh, embodied energy and embodied carbon indicators. Um, that can be useful later on when I uh, kind of uh, move into the Grasshopper workflows to show how you can kind of assess the overall embodied carbon uh, in, in the thermal model, meaning the envelope and uh, the floors and slabs and interior walls, um, excluding the structure. Um, okay, so once I'm, I'm happy with this, I can kind of uh, move forward and select these, uh, these items. Um, I want to um, keep kind of this uh, this U value and this structure for now and um, see whether kind of my upgraded envelope um, provides me with any benefits. So run this again. And now I'm back kind of at my results explorer and I can take a look at the energy use intensity charts again. So now um, we finally kind of pushed the design below the baseline, but it's still quite high. Um, and as you see here, we, we have high heating uh, loads and we have um, fairly small cooling loads in this case. We can 
further inspect kind of what's causing these, um, these high uh, EOI values by looking at the energy flows. Here you see kind of a balance, um, an energy balance chart where we see kind of um, a significant chunk kind of goes into infiltration, uh, mechanical ventilation uh, is, is though even more significant. So this is one thing that uh, I want to look at more closely. So uh, can we maybe upgrade our mechanical ventilation system to have heat recovery? And um, at the same time, can we use like a better system to provide heating and cooling? Um, and for that, I want to kind of jump into the, go back to my modeling interface and I'm going to just edit kind of these templates or these kind of settings at the zone level, looking at the HVAC system more closely. So we modeled everything with a COP of one at this point. So this would be, um, you know, if you just want to calculate the loads, um, a fine assumption kind of to see what the space loads are. But uh, if you're using a system, then probably you have um, a better COP. So if, what if we had a heat pump with a COP of three and we assume it's the same for cooling and then we'll kind of scroll even further down and also turn on heat recovery for our mechanical ventilation. So here we are kind of using the ASHRAE fresh air requirements per person and per zone area. Um, and then um, this kind of uh, leads to significant ventilation rates and the heat recovery will probably be very beneficial. So let's select this and run again. And then we can kind of observe what we have changed and how, how the results have changed. All right, now this obviously has a significant impact. As you see, now we lowered this to uh, almost 114, uh, 114 um, UI. And kind of looking at the data uh, at the building scale, uh, everything seems to, be, uh, seems to be good. Now, um, looking at this UI chart now, I can see that um, significant energy consumption now comes from the lighting system. And this is another thing that Johnny had optimized in the first webinar, um, where he kind of looked at how we can, how we better daylighting and how can we, um, how can we push, um, push the lighting power density down. And uh, he designed kind of a space for uh, a lighting power density of 3.5 uh, with a target luminance of 300 lux. Um, I also want to kind of at this point jump at the kind of zone level. You can also look at the data at the zone level. So that we have a we have a uh, nice way to explore kind of, for example, hourly zone temperatures. You can look at this and see how the, uh, the cooling system kicks in in the summer and um, uh, maintains comfort. And uh, in the winter time, you can also look at the uh, MRT air temperatures and operative temperature. But um, more interestingly at this point maybe is kind of looking at um, the energy flows. And you can nicely see here the lighting is basically turned on fully during the day. This is what I kind of want to uh, direct your attention to. And uh, there seems to be kind of no notion of like taking advantage of good daylighting at this point in the model. So um, I want to go back and fix some of these lighting related things in my model to reduce the EOI that you're seeing kind of up here, uh, kind of working on this yellow portion here. Um, so going back into my model, um, now I want to kind of focus on the gains tab, look at my assumed kind of uh, uh, thermal uh, loads from people, from equipment, those two I won't touch, although this is arguably still very high. Um, I want to kind of focus on the lighting. So in this case, um, fairly, fairly um, high assumption for the lighting, probably assu assuming some incandescent lighting uh, or uh, um, a fluorescent lighting and not LED at this point. So we want to lower this to kind of what Johnny had kind of designed, uh, picking with the right, uh, picking the right luminaires and uh, tweaking the design a bit. And I also want to lower the target luminance to 300. Um, and I want to turn on the dimming system. And this is kind of important um, to, if, if you want to kind of see daylighting benefits, you really need to kind of turn the dimming system on Otherwise, um, the lights will just be kind of turned on whenever uh, this schedule here uh, shows um, that there's people in the space and that actually use the lighting. You can look at the schedule, what it kind of assumes here. So you can nicely see um, like in the morning, people, people to come in and turn the light on, keep it on all day and then turn it off once they leave. 
and uh, that the, there also is a weekend kind of uh, as part of the schedule. Um, you could change these schedules and import and use your own schedules, obviously, but I'm just going to keep this as such and I'm going to use the dimming to kind of lower my lighting uh, demands in this building. So I changed, I changed the lighting power density, I changed the target illuminance and I changed the dimming system. Oh, I implement a dimming system that is continuously dimming. So I click OK, uh, I commit these changes and then I can run this again. And we're switching back to our results panel. And now you see how this kind of significantly lowered the lighting, um, lighting related energy demand. And I want to kind of point again down to this, um, to, the, um, to the hourly energy flows that you're seeing here. Um, you can see that uh, the lighting now has is significantly smaller and just kind of um, turns up and down with the daylight availability in the zone. And again, here we're using NG plus um, split flux method um, to estimate the lighting levels. Um, you could also obviously bring um, results from the more detailed daylight simulations over and um, use those as the basis for this. Um, if I kind of, um, I can flick through the zones, I should see there's at least uh, one more zone kind of that has similar problems um, because it doesn't have any windows, which is the interior one. Okay, so um, with that, um, I mean, I could obviously continue and push this down even further. I could choose better glazing systems and, uh, and, and tweak my envelope and my internal workings even a bit more. Um, but now I kind of, I feel for this part of this webinar, I'm happy with my result. And now I wanna kind of, I wanna publish this to, um, uh, or, and look at data uh, more closely. So I can obviously export the data as a CSV if I wanna be able to do custom analyses and so forth. Um, and I'm just gonna save this as a CSV on my desktop. This will give me access to all of the data that the energy model kind of produced at our, in an hourly resolution and zone by zone. So it's a lot of data, it's gonna be a huge spreadsheet. Um, and I can export the IDF file as well if you wanna kind of take this um, and um, look at the data um, or the model assumptions as, as an IDF. I'll export that as well. And then you can also look at reports. Um, so I'm gonna just export this one as well. And, and now on my desktop, I have um, these three files um, that we can take a look at quickly. Uh, I'm just gonna open them in a text editor um, quickly. So you have full access to the, um, to the IDF file. There's the whole data set kind of in as a comma separated value file um, given to you kind of every, every data and every variable at, at this kind of hourly resolution and per zone. And you can also take a look at the report, which is basically uh, the typical NG plus summary report um, that describes kind of the envelope, describes the, the EUI and so forth. If you want to post process the data, it's all there. It's, uh, it's all accessible. Um, and then lastly, I want to show this um, AAA DDX link that we have implemented. So you can, you can publish this result to AAA DDX uh, directly by just clicking on this. And I don't know my firm key and my user key by heart. So I'm not going to uh, type this in for you, but I, I loaded one, I uploaded one of these things um, previously, and I want to kind of show you how this looks like at the EIE, at the, on the AIE uh, website. So this is kind of the last uh, simulation that I ran, and it automatically published it to this uh, interface, and we pre-fill everything that the API allows in this case. So we uh, upload the, uh, the predicted UI, we upload the floor area, and um, all of the kind of settings that we have assumed um, in, in the model, right? And then you can kind of use this um, to accelerate the 2030 challenge reporting. All right, so with this, I wanna conclude the Rhino site uh, and I wanna switch, uh, switch gears a little bit, go into the um, graspable workflows, just to kind of um, sh those, um, for, the, for this demo, I'm, I'm gonna save the file quickly and then I'm gonna kind of clean, uh, clean the slate, uh, use just an empty file. Um, 
moving forward. And I'm going to launch, I'm launching Grasshopper and with the installer comes kind of the Climate Studio Energy side um, tab, which, which gives you con um, control over all of these components. And for kind of to get started, this can be very daunting. The, we have a lot of components that allow, kind of, allow you to flexibly uh, parameterize an energy model, do optimization and all kinds of things, uh, uh, interesting data manipulation and so forth. To make this a little bit less daunting, we have uh, implemented um, a component that uh, can basically automatically generate template workflows for you here. And I wanna use this kind of just to showcase some uh, functionality of, of the model, uh, modeling capabilities on the Grasshopper side. So you can, for example, look at the weather data and there's a workflow here um, that can pull diurnal averages for you just like you know it from uh, other kind of weather analysis tools, but this brings the data onto the grass of a canvas for you to kind of play with and manipulate it. So there's, you see there's a weather component that then kind of just feeds this data into, uh, into our plotting uh, components here. Um, similarly, you can kind of select um, other workflows that, um, for example, allow you to manipulate constructions and uh, allow you to kind of create uh, custom schedules. I'm just gonna kind of show you this, uh, this process here for the schedules and so just select it. It will populate the screen with the workflows and you see kind of all the different ways you can generate uh, schedules. And I just wanna quickly kind of walk you through this. Um, so this is kind of, you can pull data from a CSV file, generate schedules. Um, this is all kind of straightforward, but one reason why this is really helpful to do this in Grasshopper is you can also do climate-based controls where you pull the weather data and use that as a control strategy. So for example, here, this could be a control schedule for my cooling system or for natural ventilation as I'm kind of um, moving forward. And, and you could, this can be arbitrarily complex as you, as you can imagine with Grasshopper. And then we pass these objects into the library and once they're kind of in the library, you can select them from Rhino or from Grasshopper or from anywhere you like. Um, okay, so um, then I wanna kind of quickly jump into some more advanced uh, modeling workflows on the energy modeling side. So we have kind of this, this shoebox model, which uh, is too simple after going going through the energy modeling workflows on the Rhino side, but I wanna show the airflow network modeling capabilities here. Uh, let's click on this. So we have, um, we have kind of a template and to just kind of show the geometry uh, that is kind of internalized in this Grasper file quickly here. So we have our zone settings and you see kind of the same setup um, procedure is kind of the same logic as we have on the Rhino side now is um, just manifested in components. You can kind of control the settings just like we did on the Rhino side. You can also load these kind of things from templates if you like. So these are all also accessible. And then the same is true for Windows, right? So you get the same settings to play with and set. And then this is passed uh, into uh, this kind of networker component that builds the thermal model and then this component executes the, the simulation. So if I click on this, this is now running um, uh, natural ventilation simulation uh, using Energy Plus's airflow network. And then we are basically pulling out this, uh, this data here, um, looking at kind of flows, for example. And um, in this case, I can just scrub through time and see how kind of the, the flow direction changes and the, the flow intensities change over time. Um, I can obviously also pull air changes per zone and then plot them. In that, same, uh, in that same way, kind of using this graphing component. And uh, obviously these workflows can be customized and, and manipulated at any point where you like. So, and then um, lastly, I not lastly, um, I wanna show kind of a, the spatial thermal comfort approach here. So if, you kind of, if, you, if you're interested in that, we can um, model uh, thermal comfort um, spatially as well using kind of these, uh, these tools and yeah, I need to run the analysis uh, quickly. So where we kind of ex can extract uh, surface temperatures and uh, detailed node temperatures kind of moving forward. Um, and as this completes, as you see here, so we have kind of, we have a, so this, this zone is not previewing. Um, okay, so 
a uh, little hiccup in the template file. So you see um, we have kind of two zones. One has a double-sided glazing or um, double-sided facade and no shading. The other zone has a shading system implemented in the same way this is set up as the previous example, but now we can extract kind of other information here. We can scrub through time and kind of look at the MRT and how it is changing spatially, for example. And we can also extract the surface, tem uh, the surface temperatures, for example. And then again, we can kind of scrub through time and see how these temperatures change. We can also plot the actual number value if, if we want to. Um, okay, so, um, I have two more workflows that I want to go through and then I'm going to open it up for, uh, for questions. Um, so for example, you can model photovoltaic systems as well. Again, there's a template workflow for you. And if we can simple geometry setup and pre-run uh, simulation results, you see kind of the, the performance of the different panel locations that could be tested. And it's a very simple uh, workflow where you define panels with efficiencies and the, the geometry, and then you pass it onto the, PV simulation module, and then you can extract data. And that's um, in a similar way as we kind of had showed it before. You can use this to custom color, um, um, color code the panels um, based on their performance, but you can also look at kind of the uh, monthly performance of these panels um, to compute um, renewable energy potential uh, in your model. And then lastly, you can obviously use the grasshopper side um, as, as, um, very, very powerful in terms of what you can do with it. I want to kind of show you the massing analysis that one could do here. So clicking on this will pre-populate the canvas panel with a bit more complex uh, workflow and a highly customized uh, simulation workflow. I just want to quickly kind of zoom out. We have um, an urban model loaded in um, from, from, a, um, from another tool. Uh, pull, uh, geometry is pulled in, contextual geometry is pulled in. And um, as you see here, um, there's, uh, there's a component that, oops, that basically um, auto generates a massing model here in the middle. And you, if, you, if, you, if you wanna see the kind of the input geometry, I'm just gonna quickly turn this preview off. Um, the input geometry really is just a simple volume that you can modify and play with. And then uh, this volume is basically sliced into floors and you can specify the different heights. And then from this, from this geometry, we can automatically um, generate uh, window to wall ratios, shading systems, and you can kind of modify them here. So for example, if you wanted to kind of modify um, the west facing windows to 80%, we could do that, click here, and then this would automatically kind of redraw our facade for us. Um, and we can, we can control the number of uh, subdivisions or, or maximum glazing element length and so forth. And then um, from this contextual geometry that was loaded from a different program, uh, we, can, we can kind of automatically simplify this by just picking the surfaces that are relevant, shaders in this case, using this workflow. Again, just kind of a, um, a tool uh, that you can find up here. Um, and then it just kind of, um, through simple ray casting selects surfaces that are relevant for shading and then passes this on to the analysis. So we, we get the window, we get the shading uh, geometry, and then we have pulled out some custom settings up here that we want to play with in, in the massing scheme. So for example, you can set the climate, you can select the different use type, you can change some parameters like fluorescent, fluorescent to LED, turn on dimming system, switch HVAC systems out, which is, uh, you know, switching just the COP in this case, you can define the electric cost factors and the carbon emission factors, um, and then switch from a kind of heavy mass building to a lightweight building and then change the U values. So this is kind of all encapsulated in these components. And if, you, if you're interested, you can kind of um, click on them and kind of you see how this is implemented. It even uh, includes um, an example for scripting so this is kind of sh showing you how you can um, interface with Climate Studio as a hacker, basically, um, scripting some of the inputs uh, and modifying um, the input sets. <clears throat> and then this is again, you know, it automatically generates the energy model, it's passed into this networker component and then into the simulation component. And then uh, we laid out uh, 
uh, basically a template um, analysis dashboard for you here that gives you the load breakdown uh, as a balance chart here and then uh, the EOI plotted at the bottom. It gives you kind of the total site EOI and the AIA baseline just like in, on the Rhino side and then we can extract uh, the embodied carbon of the envelope and the operational carbon that is kind of coming from the um, monthly energy data that you see up here. And um, just when you, when you change um, elements in the envelope, um, this, all of these parameters will change uh, accordingly, right? So, and you can extract the embodied carbon content um, using this component and you can post it as kind of per, per construction or kind of give it out as a total. You can model this over a longer lifetime period if you know kind of the exchange rates um, and kind of lifetimes of, of your constructions. Okay, so this is kind of where I wanted to end and um, maybe now it's a good time to open up the floor for questions in the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Thanks, yeah, we've been uh, busy trying to answer some of your questions and we still have a few opens just in the process of typing. Uh, thanks, Timor. Uh, maybe I'll just summarize some of the the key question topics that I saw, and then we can, uh, if you keep on typing, we'll scan, uh, I'll be scanning what uh, you put in the type in the question box and we can address those as well. Uh, so I think the biggest question were always regarding to the capabilities of Climate Studio Energy to model various types of geometry. So as you saw here as a base geometry, you have the concept of a zone. Uh, to the zone, you can add an exterior window or if you want an air wall between two adjacent zones, then you have to define an interior window. Um, when you have two zones touching each other, then um, Climate Studio recognizes automatically the adjacencies and defines this as an interior wall. Uh, if you wanna define any zone in your model as an adiabatic surface, then as Timo has shown for in the example for the floor of the zone, you have to then basically model the zones as separate objects um, in Rhino and assign them adiabatic zones. Uh, that I guess was a key question. Now the, uh, you can always export the IDF files as Timo has shown, you cannot import IDF files uh, automatically and read them in. Uh, another uh, round of, and Timo, just interrupt me or add to that uh, if you mm -hmm. want. Uh, another uh, round of question was uh, regarding uh, the units. So right now everything is uh, in SI units. Uh, we heard that a couple of times and we'll try to accommodate at least that the main outputs uh, can be generated in Imperial units as well. Um, there was a question regarding um, what, how we can model HVAC systems right now. So right now all the systems are being modeled as constant uh, COPs, which are provided in the template. Um, we, uh, we don't model any systems at this moment in time. If you wanna do that right now, the only option is for you to export the IDF file and add the systems separately there. Uh, the question that came up quite a lot of uh, times always, when you look at the graphs, uh, can you export the graphs and um, generate uh, them in your own environment as well? So in, um, uh, in Grasshopper, you can obviously do that. Uh, in uh, Climate Studio for the daylighting and the energy part, we are right now working on a method that just hopefully will allow you for our figures to uh, select the figures and then write out the results as a CSV value. Uh, and generally, I mean, that's something that we said on the daylighting side as well. A lot of this data is really massive. So the reason why we are storing a lot of the data in these files as binary files is just uh, expediency. So you basically have your Rhino model and then whenever you load a result, the binary file gets loaded in. Uh, we are very open to provide export data in any format and shape uh, that you might find useful. It's just a matter of uh, kind of for us uh, imagining or for you telling us what the export, desired export is. Um, there was some question about the link in, in terms of lighting schedule between uh, when you do a very detailed daylighting analysis uh, on in Climate Studio daylighting. Uh, same as for DIVA, we want to get, of course, to the point where you can then predict what the lighting schedule 
on the daylighting side is and just feed it right into a uh, climate studio energy that's in the making. Um, Mac compatibility, uh, that's a question, uh, well, similar to what we said two days ago, you, um, you need the late, uh, we only uh, support right now climate studio under uh, Windows uh, and um, you have to use the Windows version of Rhino as well. We're actually all using a Mac ourselves, funny enough. So uh, if you um, use Basecamp or another virtual machine where that works very well uh, with Climate Studio. And of course, um, you can just use a Windows computer. Uh, one more question was about uh, baseline implementation. So right now we have the American Institute of Architecture baseline that uh, set that Timor described. We are also actively looking in ASHRAE 90.1 workflows. Uh, if there are any European baselines that we should be aware of, please just uh, uh, just feel free to send us emails, share these links with us. We are always scanning kind of the world of building science for good, meaningful baselines that people are actually using. And um, just looking at what I see here. Um, Implementing a library similar to SAM. I don't know what SAM is, whoever wrote this, if you can uh, write that out for me. Um, ah, T here's a question, Timo. Can you show how the Grasshopper components can expand to show all inputs rather than using uh, the convenient forms? What does that mean? Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is this is a really good point um, that I didn't touch upon, but uh, in Grasshopper, you can basically access all of the, the inputs and then modify them parametrically, right? So uh, referring to kind of the optimization capability. So if you were to use something like Galapagos, you could uh, obviously uh, link this uh, kind of with uh, something uh, like these sliders um, that pull out the kind of uh, simple parameters. Uh, if you were interested in kind of uh, getting full parametric control over everything, uh, that we kind of set through these convenient forms. Uh, yes, you can do that. You can uh, kind of um, use these more kind of complex components with more inputs if you want, uh, if, you're, uh, if you would like to. Um, uh, this, you'll find those kind of under the settings tab here um, uh, in Climate Studio or um, even, even more advanced and maybe even more powerful would be kind of to use something like a scripting component where you, for example, in this case, what you're seeing here is we are modifying, uh, we're pulling a template and then we are modifying this template after the fact where I kind of override the lighting power density um, and the dimming system, the HVAC settings and some of the cost factors and, and, and constructions. And then you can, obviously everything that is kind of uh, shown here as an input can be connected to Galapagos as an, um, and, uh, and, and other optimization tools. Um, and then you can kind of set this up as a parametric run, if you like. I hope this answers your questions. If you have more questions, feel free to either shoot me an email or um, um, post it on the on Zoom. Oh, there's another question here. Can you define the type of HVAC system, fan, coil, VAV, and so forth? Uh, right now, I'll let Timo answer that. It's right now. Okay. Yeah, so um, the, as Christo has said um, um, before, so at this point, we, we are only modeling um, an ideal loads air system. Um, and we use constant COPs uh, to kind of estimate the load. So this, these workflows are meant to be very early design exploration tools that kind of set uh, the focus on the architecture and the, the um, the relationship uh, of the environment and architecture. So therefore we, we have, uh, uh, we are a bit more on the simpler side um, with, the, with the systems, but uh, the simple air, uh, ideal air load system can already do quite, quite a bit uh, in terms of modeling systems. So you can uh, specify mechanical ventilation, you can specify heat recovery systems and their efficiencies, and you can use an economizer. And you can also estimate fan energy using kind of an ideal fan model uh, if you know the pressure rise that this fan has to overcome. And then this is kind of um, what, what you can do at this point. Um, and um, yeah, we've, we've heard this a couple of times. Um, 
that uh, there's, there's an interest in modeling more complex HVAC systems where you can define the coils and so forth. This is at this point not possible, um, but we are, we are looking into kind of um, exploring some options whether this is feasible or not. But again, um, the, the, the main use case or application that we see for this tool is really in early design optimization. Yeah, we would also say if you think of the daylighting energy part, there's this coherent way of how would an architect or, an, uh, or a green building consultants work on the um, on the massing model or uh, on massing model decisions or facade decisions. Uh, that is really more where the focus uh, use cases come from. So uh, that was the question again: if we can ex import an IDF file, uh, there would be no no obvious, in our scenario thinking, there's no obvious uh, source where, where this IDF file would be coming from. Because if we assume that the designer uh, comes up with the shape and form of the building, then um, the or origin of the model would be in Rhino and, and not um, come up from another tool. There was a question, one on if we are providing, that was actually interesting, uh, U value for the whole building. We don't right now, but we know this is, this is super interesting and we have been looking into providing building level information such as compact factor of the building, overall U value and so forth. So this is a very uh, clear use case that, that would fit, is in line with what we are thinking about. Uh, yeah, just to add to this, yeah. um, you can always look at these uh, energy plus output reports which summarize um, the, the envelope um, kind of in the way that uh, the question was framed. So, so you can kind of, if you scroll down, um, you can kind of look at the, uh, uh, let me expand this a little bit, the gross wall, gross wall area, uh, window to wall ratio, uh, kind of as a summary, uh, split into north, south, east, and west, and so forth. And then you can also see the U values of the constructions and the envelope um, uh, in, this, in this report. So it's a fairly kind of, um, right, right here, so you can see, um, you can see the summary and what kinds of constructions were used in the zones and so forth. So this is, this is fairly helpful kind of after the fact to, uh, to do reporting uh, or to um, just double check whether the model actually modeled what you, you intended to model. Yeah, uh, actually we are just a few minutes before the hour. So I just wanted to uh, quickly, if you give me the screen, just talk about next steps. We are, we are uh, happy to stay on the line, but just for those of you that have to leave, finish up, uh, um, uh, our thoughts. So if I can, if you can let me share my screen. That would yeah. Be, yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you. No, which one is it here? Um, so uh, just in terms of next steps, if you're interested in using the tool and you wanna um, uh, want to try it out, you can um, request uh, just, if you go to the Climate Studio site, if you request a, a free trial, we'll be sending you an installer uh, and, um, and a, a quote, depending on the size of your firm. The way Climate Studio is uh, the, uh, distributed in professional practice is through an annual subscription model where the, the price of the first seat depends on the size of your firm and uh, then there's a more constant, um, number for uh, for more seats. Uh, I just, because the question came up a couple of times, also want to highlight the ambassador program. So for every any students or educators, uh, Climate Studio is completely free. We already have set up this ambassador program with a, a whole bunch of universities right now. Uh, so the way this works, we need a, kind of a contact person at each university that we call an ambassador. And um, if that person contacts us, we provide that person with a school-specific uh, climate studio license. And then uh, that person is basically the point person for all the students interested in using the tool. They can install climate studio on their own computers and, um, and then... Uh, uh, run the license and then it's going to work. And the uh, normal times, uh, usually you would have to log in onto your uh, network at least once a week in order to, uh, on the school's network, in order to use the tool. We understand there are some issues right now with people working remotely. So um, this, the license that you are getting from your uh, ambassador will just work wherever you are. So that should make it super easy for you to, um, to use the tool. Uh, that's the, the goal behind the software. Um, 
I think that's mostly what I have. There were some questions regarding and how far we are considering European baseline norms as well. And again, uh, we are really interested in learning from some of these baselines. If you share them with us, we're happy to, um, to consider putting them in or providing the ability for you to model uh, your building accordingly. Um, we are actually on the hour. Let me see if there are any, are there any open questions? I don't see my questions right now. Timo, do you see any? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm fielding most of them. <laughs> I'm typing feverishly. Um, okay. So please answer any questions if you have. Otherwise, we are on the hour and we really thank you for your time. Hopefully you found uh, the tool useful. We're uh, um, glad for you to, um, to try Climate Studio out. We have, uh, as you see on the website, already a whole bunch of video tutorials for the daylighting side. And by mid-May, we are planning to add uh, a similar series of um, Climate Studio energy tutorials as well. And we'll be uh, um, providing a recording of today's webinar uh, very soon um, on the Climate Studio website as well.